Welcome to the Change Now Film Market. We are very happy to have you with us today. In parallel to the film festival, the Change Now Film Market aims to bring together film and audiovisual professionals to accelerate change. We believe that the audiovisual sector has a big role to play in changing mentalities. On the other hand, the film industry must also change and adopt a more responsible approach in order to move towards a sustainable audiovisual production. Producers, directors, distributors, screenwriters, film students, but also specialists, experts, and committed citizens are here to shape the future of the film industry. We have prepared for you three roundtable discussions on three major topics, sustainable film production, impact documentaries, script writing keys, to think how to write a film in order to change the world. Also, a pitching sessions with the film festival atmosphere. But before, let's start with a fireside chat with a special guest, Emma Stewart, Netflix sustainability officer, interviewed by Marta Garcia Larry. Good morning. Hi, um, this is Martha. I'm joined by Emma Stewart, Netflix Sustainable Officer, Sustainability Officer. How are you, Emma? I'm very well. Nice to see you, Martha. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to give a little background uh, on yourself before we jump in. Uh, as a scientist, you've worked in Kenya and Brazil and in Mexico, studying their ecosystems. I also believe you were moved by the stories of the local people, and in 2009, you joined a research group for climate objectives based on science. I think that's very interesting background to bring to the entertainment industry. Um, so uh, I'll jump right in. I, I saw your program, the Net Zero Carbon Plus Nature program, and I'd love for you and for our audience to know a little bit more about it. Yes, of course. Well, thank you for asking. First, we started by evaluating our impact. So we measured our carbon footprint for two years and we got that audited. And what that showed us is that our carbon footprint is about 1 million metric tons per year. And over 90% of that actually sits with companies we buy from, which is quite common. Roughly half of the footprint stems from the physical production of the film and television shows that you see on our service, followed by our corporate operations and the purchased goods, the things that we buy. We, like many, use cloud providers uh, like Amazon Web Services and OpenConnect to stream our service, and that together as, uh, comes to about only 5% of the total footprint. So now that we understand the footprint, we announced our intention by next year to reach net zero emissions and to do so by reducing our own emissions in line with climate science and then to invest in the power of nature to retain and remove carbon from the atmosphere, ultimately bringing us to net zero. So if you're familiar with that old adage of reduce, reuse, recycle, this is one for the modern era, reduce, retain, remove. And we call this net zero plus nature. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Very, very ambitious. Um, I also read in the report that you were advised by key players. Uh, I don't know if, I know you're, you, you've done a great scientific background in all this, and I don't know if there are some names you'd like to share. I find it very, very relevant, uh, the people who've been experts by your side on, on all this process. Yes, we are incredibly lucky to have an advisory group uh, who we have asked to independently and in a voluntary capacity uh, guide and provoke us. And this group includes uh, luminaries like Christiana Figueres, the Costa Rican diplomat who is credited with striking the Paris Agreement. It includes the head of climate at World Wildlife Fund, the head of climate at Environmental Defense Fund, Dr. Johan Rockström from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. And in fact, we'll be talking later about a film featuring his work that will launch on June 4th. And he will be speaking to you all 
later today. We're also joined by Shige Bastida, who is a young uh, climate activist, indigenous, Chilean, Mexican, incredible woman. And she really helps us tap into uh, the next generation and what they're looking for from our generations. And then we have Tom Rivet Karnak, who wrote a wonderful book called The Future We Choose about two different possible futures, one with a stable climate and in which the planet it continues to be the friend to humanity that it has been for our entire existence, and one with a warming of about four degrees Celsius, which is what we're currently, unfortunately, on track for, uh, that will really not be uh, an enjoyable experience uh, for anyone. Mm, absolutely. No, I, I found it very interesting to see who you're surrounded by. I think there's a saying in Spain that, uh, tell me who you hang out and I'll tell you who you are. So I find it very, very interesting who you've surrounded yourself by. Um, stepping a little bit further into, into your net zero plan, as you mentioned before, uh, uh, about half of your emissions come from uh, the productions, the audiovisual productions. And um, I'm really interested to know, how are you passing along uh, that uh, your goals to both internal productions and external productions? I believe you obviously buy a lot of content as well. So if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, this part is very exciting. So if you'll indulge me a minute, one of the things uh, my team uses as a mantra is a, a three-word mantra of optimize, electrify, decarbonize. Now, what do I mean by that? Optimize means eliminating energy that you don't need, essentially waste. Uh, and electrifying means shifting from largely fossil-based fuels to electricity, which is much easier to clean uh, and also is cheaper, typically. And then decarbonize the remaining power. And my family actually applied this in our own home. So we first swapped out inefficient lighting and equipment when we moved in, and we saved money every month on our utility bills. Then we changed our hybrid car to an electric car. Uh, my children actually charged the electric car, which is a side benefit I didn't anticipate. And then we decarbonized the remaining power that we needed and that additional power we needed from the electric vehicle by leasing solar on our roof and buying green power from our utility. That same mantra of optimize, electrify, decarbonize applies equally well to Netflix and in particular our productions. So when it comes to optimizing with our productions, we try and hire local crews wherever possible. That of course avoids unnecessary travel. It creates local jobs. Uh, we donate excess food from our catering. Turns out that food waste is a very potent greenhouse gas. And we use things like LED lighting, which is highly efficient, 75% less energy used than conventional lighting. It also creates less heat, which means we have to do less cooling uh, in our facilities, and it doesn't melt the makeup quite so much, which is a win-win-win. Now, when you move to electrification, we're really looking to swap out diesel generators that are so prevalent in the entertainment industry and look instead towards mobile batteries and eventually towards fuel cells. We also already provide free electrical vehicle charging for our employees, and we're now on the market for electrical vehicles that serve our different production needs. And then lastly, decarbonizing. While we do lease most of our studio space and corporate facilities, we, wherever possible, source green energy through the utility, working with the landlord, and also purchase renewable energy credits where that's not available locally. So we actually attained 99.9% .9 renewable electricity in 2020 through those channels. Now, when it comes to supporting our productions, we're providing them with things like carbon calculation tools so that we can really help them understand where the fuel and electricity in particular uh, sits within their operations and how we can together decarbonize that. Mm, super interesting. I was taking notes right there as a producer myself, trying to learn from all of this. It's great. Um, I was going to ask for uh, three takeaways, but I, I think you've summarized beautifully. Local crew, excess food, LED lighting, and of course, calculating uh, will allow you to compensate. Um, so you mentioned before, continuing on your on your uh, CO2 breakdown, that uh, your digital impact, the web services and streaming services, was was a little uh, a very small amount, a five percent amount. I read that um, 
you have been able to calculate this thanks to the DIMPACT program and the support of the Bristol University, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, the result was that it was about an hour is a little less than 100 grams of CO2. And I'm fascinated by this. Uh, measuring digital impact, I think, is in, in high uh, demand. I think uh, people are wondering how, how can we do that. So um, without too many technical specifics, but if you could give us a little bit of what that looks like and how it's done. Sure, of course. So streaming involves really three steps. The data centers, and as I mentioned, we rely on Amazon Web Services and Open Connect for data centers. And that represents only 5% of the overall company footprint. Beyond that, there is internet infrastructure provided by internet service providers. And then the devices that people use to, we hope, enjoy Netflix among thousands of other activities they might do online. And those three phases together make up streaming. They also make up publishing and advertising and other uses of the internet. Now, as an entertainment company, it's perhaps not surprising that the majority of our carbon emissions come from the production of film and television shows. What greenhouse gas accounting uh, requires is that the emissions from internet and device use reside with the internet service providers and the device manufacturers. It's only logical, they have operational control over those technologies. However, we still want to contribute to a joint effort of tackling the emissions related to streaming. So we've joined up with a number of other streaming companies and broadcasters, advertisers, publishers, companies that use the internet to deliver their products and services in a group called DIMPACT. And the technical work there is led by a team at the University of Bristol, as you mentioned, they have worked for about a year and a half using best practices in life cycle assessment, it's called. And what they've done is built a calculation tool that allows all of the companies around the table to estimate in a robust fashion the true carbon footprint of streaming or publishing or advertising. And what we found when we ran our data through the DIMPACT calculator was that a, an hour of streaming Netflix in 2020 equated to less than 100 grams of greenhouse gases. Now, what does that mean? That's driving a quarter mile in a gas or petrol powered car. So if I had one, I could go about a, a block and a half from here in my home in San Francisco. And thankfully and happily from a research standpoint, the other peers around the table, these other companies, when they ran their numbers, fell within that same range. So that gives us a really great degree of confidence about these estimations. Now that we have a fuller understanding of where the emissions lie in the streaming delivery chain, we can partner up with the internet service providers, device manufacturers to try and tackle them. As one illustrative example, in Ireland, you can actually stream video with zero emissions. Now, why is that? It's because the Amazon Web Services data center and a number of the internet service providers have purchased clean energy. And either through the utility or on their own devices, they have managed to decarbonize the delivery. Now, what we would love to see is other data center, other internet service providers demanding clean energy from those local utilities so that everyone can stream at zero carbon. Of course, the higher the demand, the better the better service we'll all get. It sounds lovely. Um, we have only a few minutes left, but I wouldn't, I, I really wouldn't like to miss out on what you mentioned before. I believe um, you call it sustainable storytelling, and I think it has a big part to, to play in all this as well. Uh, so I'd love to know what you're doing as, uh, what are you intending to do? I know you've also done some actions in this sense, but how can we use, I mean, Netflix is about entertainment, so how do we best use storytelling in, in this seek for change? Yeah, we like to use the phrase, entertain to sustain. Um, and as a scientist, I, I can't help but share one of my favorite quotes, which is from a famous uh, evolutionary biologist at Harvard University called Stephen Jay Gould. 
And he said, humans are primates who tell stories. It's a defining and differentiating feature for our species. And indeed, the creatives with whom we have the pleasure of working at Netflix are already telling sustainability stories. Climate change in particular is arguably the most epic story of our time. And so as we work to make storytelling more sustainable, as we've talked about, we are supporting them in their efforts to tell more of these stories more effectively. I am delighted to share that when we dug into the numbers, in 2020 alone, we found that 160 million households around the world chose to watch at least one title on Netflix that overtly shone a spotlight on sustainability, 160 million. Now these titles can include Netflix originals um, that deepen our appreciation for the planet. Like for example, Our Planet, the series, which we made available for free also during the pandemic. Or My Octopus Teacher, which recently won an Oscar and really shows the deep connection between humans and other living creatures. On June 4th, you're in for a treat. Uh, we released Breaking Boundaries, in which globally recognized uh, scientist Dr. Johan Rockström, we affectionately call him uh, Johan Rockstar, and Sir David Attenborough, explain the science of our planet and the dangerous tipping points we will trigger if we don't cut emissions in half by 2030 and protect a third of our natural ecosystems. Now, Dr. Uh, Rockström will be speaking later today at this event. And as he and Sir David Attenborough put it, Earth has been humanity's greatest friend, but before long, it could become our greatest foe. President Joe Biden recently shared breaking boundaries with 40 heads of state at his leaders' climate on, uh, summit on si uh, climate, and Sir David Attenborough will feature it in his G7 keynote. Now, so that we have something for everyone, we couple these forceful calls for action with more lighthearted, playful titles um, that uh, show hopeful solutions. As one example, Down to Earth with Zac Efron, or some of my children's favorites are Arctic Dogs, Octonauts, of course, and Izzy's Koala World in Australia. And then there are green moments sprinkled throughout comedies and dramas like Dead to Me or Atypical. So we are excited to support our creative partners in telling these climate savvy stories. And every day our content team brings us opportunities to do just that. Mm, absolutely. As a filmmaker, I think we have one of the, one of the many important tools for change and, and happy to see that Netflix is on board and, and working hard at it. I'd like to thank you for these moments together and invite anybody who'd like to get more information on, on Netflix website where I could find and do my cheat sheet. And uh, let's leave everybody for a morning of filmmaking, of uh, impact documentaries and, and much more. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Marta. <laughs>